Welcome to Romero Records Virtual Cast. Today we have on Mari Fong. How's it going? It's going really well. How are you? I'm um, well. So uh, I saw you do a lot of stuff about about health and and having mental health and having uh, a strong mind. So I, I, I'm a, I'm a huge advocate for mental health. I know that I think there's been a a big push for that lately because of uh, athletes. I don't know. Did you hear the story of um, God, what is her name? The the gymnast. She uh, for for uh, uh, USA. She Simone Biles. Yes. Simone Biles. Right. Yeah, her and then also that was their that young tennis player. She opted out of playing in a big uh, competition because of uh, mental health. And there's been numerous NFL athletes. Um, so uh, it seems like the athletic world and also the music world. There's been um, the baby. He's a rapper. Him and a rapper Lil Wayne, they had a song about mental health. Uh, Logic, the rapper Logic, he had a huge song about suicide that, that blew up. But uh, yeah, these, these, these things are starting to come to life and come to people's uh, attention. And I think that it's a good thing. And I think that uh, the things that you do, speaking about it, which is what everybody should be doing, um, it, it helps. Well, you know, that really is the first step often is to speak about it. Because when we talk about our own stories, uh, it allows people to open up, up about what's going on with them. And, you know, oftentimes with mood disorders, people can feel embarrassed because they may not be acting or thinking the way they normally do. And it's confusing and it's sometimes scary for that person. Um, so they, you know, don't want to talk about it. But when somebody else opens up, they say, oh, gosh, you know, somebody else is actually going through what I'm going through. Um, you know, maybe they have some advice or maybe they really do understand. Maybe I'm not alone. And oftentimes when you're going through a mood disorder or a mental health issue, you could feel very alone because it's, it's, it's just, you know, it's, um, it's, it's kind of a strange place to be because nobody is, prepares you for um, the feelings that you have while you're going through a mood disorder. Do you, do you feel like there's certain individuals who tend to, I guess, handle uh, mental situations better? I, I always say, <laughs> just a funny way I like to live life, but I always say I love hanging around people who've been through a lot of crap. Like I love hanging around people who their life has been a disaster because they know how to handle situations. Like if you hang out with people who've never been through anything, like their life has been peachy when their their pipes in their house burst or if uh, their toilet clogs up, they freak out. They act like it's the end of the world. But that's such a small thing to happen in your life. So I think people who have experienced uh, things in their life, um, maybe not at a younger age, you know, it, it might traumatize them for the, you have PTSD, but like if you've experienced things, maybe your teenage or, or early twenties, um, you tend to just be, I guess, a more headstrong person because you're like, oh, I've been through that. It's fine. Yeah, that's true. In fact, um, you know, we have a lot of different artists come on the on my podcast, which is, which is Check Your Head Mental Health for Musicians podcast. And we have people like Emilio Estevez of, I'm sorry, Emilio Castillo of Tower of Power come on. And he, gosh, he's been addicted to so many different um, drugs and alcohol that, and he's come so far uh, from the point of feeling like he was basically gonna die from alcoholism to where he is today. I mean, Tower of Power, they've celebrated 52 years uh, being touring musicians, recording musicians. And, you know, there were many times where he felt like he was gonna lose his life to addiction. And, you know, he's, he had a smile on his face. 
the entire time we were interviewing. And it just shows me that when you go through these difficult times and you survive and you thrive, you appreciate everything. I mean, you appreciate every day. You know, um, we had Sal Rodriguez of War, a, another icon, a drummer from a band that's been around for a long time. And, you know, these guys, they bring so much experience to the table. And I also love to learn from their experience. Uh, you know, on the other hand, we have people like James Arthur who just came, I just dropped this episode, but James Arthur had this huge mega single called Say You Won't Let Go. And uh, he was on the X Factor in UK, but this was all happening when he was like 25, 30 years old. I mean, right now he's 33 years old. He is mm. still going through his mental health journey. He is still going through the trials and tribulations of life, you know, um, having gone through a big partying period and, you know, having, um, you know, things happens with relationships. I mean, these are all things that we go through, you know, as we're teens, young adults, that, uh, you know, they're, that are really difficult. And, you know, he, on top of that, he is living with depression and panic attacks. So, you know, there's a lot to have to deal with when you're, you know, trying to make your way out into the world. And at the same time, you're dealing with uh, mental health issues. So I really praise those people and try to encourage uh, younger artists because like I said, it's confusing. And if they just keep going, you know, just keep trying to find those solutions uh, for recovery that fit their personality and that fit their lifestyle, there really is a much more beautiful uh, life out there where there's, you know, more gratitude, more appreciation. Do, do most people that you run into with musicians, are they having like a strong uh, friend base or family support? Um, does it seem like that has a trend for people who end up having uh, the mental health issues? Well, uh, you know, support in general is really important. It's one of the factors that uh, can help you get better. I mean, if you think about it, if you're going through anything difficult, if you have a friend or a family member that says, you know, Jackson, I, I really care about you, you know, let me help you. What can I do to help you? Uh, whether it's just listening and spending time together or actually taking action, you know, maybe um, taking somebody to a doctor's appointment or saying, hey, you know, I have a support group that I go to that I really enjoy. You know, why don't you come with me? It's, you know, this Wednesday night. I mean, those things, any show of care can really help someone turn the corner with their mental health. You know, can not only brighten their day, but really encourage them uh, if they are sick to get professional help. And, you know, there's, you know, just like with our physical health, um, mental health is sometimes is connected to our physical health. Sometimes physical conditions like um, thyroid disease or hormonal imbalance, um, heart disease. I mean, there's so many different physical conditions that can cause um, mental health conditions that, you know, it's really important to really try to play detective on what really is the issue that's going on with you. And that part is really, I think, the hardest part because, you know, sometimes we can try to cover that up and not want to deal with it because they could be very difficult emotions. I mean, trauma is one thing that we all kind of know is associated uh, sometimes with depression and anxiety. Um, so, yeah, unpacking that is, you know, it, it, it takes a lot of bravery, really you know, to look at that and really say, you know, what was going on there? You know, what, what is it that, how has that affected me? You know, do I have any, um, you know, we all talk about post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. I mean, basically that, that is having something really traumatic that happens in your life, you know, that really affected you negatively that, you know, made you cry, 
you know, grief, pain, anger that we still carry with us, you know, and things like that need to be healed in order to really, um, you know, improve our lives. I would say the number one thing that most people say after, uh, you know, if they've had a friend commit suicide or something like that, the, the number one thing people usually say, in my opinion, is, oh, I wish I could have blank, you know, hung out with them more or, or took them to the movies or done that, you know, cook that favorite meal for them again or something like that. And it's all, it all goes back to what you were just saying, that support, that being around that person and, and just doing those small things for them. That's, it's the one thing that we wish we could have done, but you know, it's, it's a day by day type thing. I, I recently actually lost a friend. He committed suicide. Um, I, I had no idea. I thought he was still living in Wisconsin and I, I can't remember when was the last time I'd actually talked to him? It was, it was this, I think it was early this year, but uh, he committed suicide in, was it September? I think it was early or late September or something like that. But um, the fact that he had did that and I, and I had, I had no clue. Somebody had to tell me um, what happened uh, through an email and I was like, oh man. And I mean, we weren't like the best of friends, but we were, we were close. Um, We we would keep up with each other every once in a while. But um, just, just thinking about the fact that, you know, it happened and we had talked about hanging out and uh, around the holidays, it was around like Thanksgiving time. I said, he, he, his family lives in Mississippi but he was living in Wisconsin at the time, but I didn't know that he had actually moved back to Mississippi. And so I live in Tennessee in Memphis area. So it's pretty close to where his family was from. So, um, you know, we, we could have hung out, we could have hung out whenever, but I, I had no idea. So, and, and those types of things make me think, you know, every time I think about him, I'm like, man, you know, I, what if I just hung out with them and, and helped them and talked to them and stuff like that. And, you know, look at in hindsight, 2020, like, oh yeah, I could have fixed everything. You know, that's, that's our, that's our thought, but who knows, you know, who knows what is the perfect remedy to help out people when they're in those situations? Well, that's it. That's the difficult part is, um, you know, there, you know, suicide is very tragic. Um, oftentimes <clears throat> we, we may not know what's really going on with that person, that person may not uh, be talking about it. They may not even be showing many signs of depression or anxiety because they're ashamed or oftentimes they isolate, they stay at home. They don't wanna see anybody because they don't wanna share with others what is really going on or they feel like it's hopeless. And you know, when somebody does commit suicide, you know, there's survivor's guilt from family and friends, exactly like the thoughts you're talking about is, what could I have done? Was there something that I could have said? Could, you know, should have, we should have gone to that baseball game when, when he suggested it. But, you know, the thing is, is that sometimes, you know, we all want to help. We all want to be there, but it's, you know, sometimes we can't, and that, and that's really the, the the honest part about it. And when somebody has depression and anxiety or any of these conditions, I always say it's not your fault that you are uh, sick and not feeling well, but it is your responsibility to take action and let somebody know that you're not doing well, or try and send an appointment for a doctor to get professional help or, you know, go to a support group. I mean, these are all things that sometimes are difficult to do when you're in a mood disorder because you don't really feel like doing a whole lot. And you, part of the condition of a lot of these disorders is feeling hopeless, feeling worthless, feeling like, you know, I've tried all these different things, nothing's going to work. But, you know, just taking a step just trying something could be the answer to recovery. 
And there are a lot of people that most people can recover for sure. They can recover or um, be able to control their condition, you know, with therapy, medication, nutrition, um, healing what's physically wrong with them. If there's a physical condition, um, maintaining that, that can also help. There's a lot of different ways, but unlocking what's the answer for you does take trial and error. And, you know, one thing I just took a um, mental health first aid class and it's almost like, you know, a CPR class where people, you know, in case there's an emergency, you know what to do. And in this class, one of the things that you mentioned is, you know, if you do come across somebody that you, you think is having um, maybe a, a mood disorder or symptoms, like maybe they lost weight and, you know, they're not working out like they used to, they're not behaving the way they normally do. They're starting to say things that sound very, you know, down, depressed, uh, you know, sounding like nothing is working for them. These are all signs, um, you know, that somebody is going through a struggle. So it's like, what do you do in those situations? Most people don't know what to say. Most people are afraid actually to approach that person and say, and kind of confront them. But I think the word confront is sort of a, uh, it almost sounds ag aggressive, Yeah. but yeah. But it's really not confront, it's more like a conversation, like pulling somebody aside and saying, you know what, I've, I've noticed that, you know, you're not uh, coming out to play basketball with us uh, like you used to, or, you know, it looks like you lost some weight and you're looking a little down. Is everything okay? What's going on? I mean, things like that. You know, I've had artists come on the podcast like Sammy Dahl, and she was going through a very bad depression. And her bandmate said, you know, took her aside one day during rehearsal and said, you know what, something is going on. You don't seem like yourself. And the first thing she said was, okay, no, I'm fine, which is what we all kind of say. But her friend said, you know what, no, I think something's going on. Let me tell you what, you know, was going on with me. And she shared her story of a very difficult time and depression. And Sammy broke down and cried. Mm. And it opened up the floodgates and she was able to get help. And she told me, she said, Mari, I thank her for having enough care and bravery just to have that simple conversation with me. And, you know, when you, you think about it, if somebody approached you like that, you know, as a good friend, a buddy, you know, at the time it might feel a little uncomfortable, but, you know, there's an appreciation there. Because yeah. your friend cares about you, loves you, and wants to help. Yeah, I, I think it takes a certain level of friend to do that kind of thing. And it's like, you know, if uh, <laughs> I always say I can always trust people who tell me I got food on my face. Because, you know, <laughs> you, you, like, you want to tell the person, but, I tell them, you know, you feel bad for doing it. But it's, it's that level of um, honesty and, and trust. and uh, being able to just talk to somebody and, and as you said, you don't want to call it confront, but you just want to bring it to light. Like you want to be able to have the uh, ability to just speak these things into this person's life because you want to be able to help them um, understand, you know, what's going on. It's, it's kind of like, uh, I, I think people are probably just afraid to to say something because they might feel it might embarrass the person and they might think it's a very fragile type thing to bring up um it's, even if like you know you see a woman and her stomach's getting big you're like oh is she pregnant i don't know i don't want to ask her if she's pregnant you know it's, it's the same thing with um uh, somebody being in a mental mental state you're like oh they seem kind of depressed i don't want to ask them hey are you depressed so it's you might think it's something that might be embarrassing for them to say, yes, I am depressed. Help me. But it, that what's the worst thing that's going to happen? They're going to say, no. All right, cool. Move on. You, you at least said something. You at least tried to help. Man, if they're fine, then they're fine. But if they're not, then you, you did something. You, you helped. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, 
the signs might be um, reacting in an angry way, um, kind of flying off the handle, or, you know, it, it could even be, you know, running away physically um, from situations. There's a lot of social anxiety. I mean, there's a lot of signs and sometimes even talking about the signs that you see, mm -hmm. uh, maybe not even putting a, a, a name to it and saying, you know, I noticed that, that, you know, you've been getting really angry and irritable. Is there something going out, you know, something else going on in your life that you might want to, you know, talk about anything like that to open up the conversation, you know, of course, with care and compassion. And, you know, sometimes also, um, you know, there's, there's different cultural, uh, there's different cultures, there's different genders that also can um, bring up obstacles in talking about mental health. I mean, I'll use my uh, culture as a as a example. I mean, I grew up here in the United States. I was born here as an American, but uh, I my mother is Japanese, my father is Chinese, and in the Asian culture, you know, oftentimes things like that, emotions, feelings, uh, situations like that are not talked about you know, it's not a normal conversation. And so that makes it, you know, difficult if it's not something, you know, that's really talked about culturally. And, and also like, for instance, uh, between males and females, I mean, mm -hmm. as women, we, we talk about everything we do. We, we, you know, confide with each other. If we have a problem, going on with our relationships or with work, we call each other like, oh my God, this is what <laughs> happened with my boss today. And we just spill it. And, and we do it because we want that connection. We need to vent. With guys, it, it might be a little bit different. You know, it might be harder to really have, you know, those great fun conversations, but also those situations where we're like, oh, you know, this is what's happening with my girlfriend. Yeah. You know, and I'm really, really depressed. I don't know. I can't get out of bed. What am I going to do that? You know, I've had people say that they have tried men who have said that they have tried to approach other men. And oftentimes they don't know what to say. It's not that they don't care, but they just don't know what to say, or mm -hmm. they'll change the subject or they'll say, you know what, let's go get something to eat. You know, sometimes those things can help to spend time, but really the best thing is to listen is to say, you know, do, what's going on, you know, tell me about it. That, you know, really does show that you care, you care enough to listen. And I think that it's been a stigma of maybe America. Um, I, I don't know, you know, maybe you could say the same for Asian culture as well, as far as like uh, men needing to be strong and, and, and powerful and it's like sometimes men need to be soft because they need to um get things off their chest and and let their mind loose and uh just because that you're you know, quote unquote man of the household doesn't mean that you don't have feelings as well and i think when i think some of the strongest men are men who are able to do that like if you're able to speak to anybody about like your feelings and then and then overcome it i think that's more powerful than somebody who just doesn't do it like they they say the big difference between um was it courage and um I, I don't know the other term but like uh courage is you know is when you have fear you are scared to do something but you do it anyways and mm -hmm. that's that's a good sign of somebody who is mentally strong is you know that it's going to make you look vulnerable to to talk to say these things that spill your feelings but you do it anyways because you know it's going to help you and i think that's that shows a stronger person than somebody who just like nope i'm just going to ball this up and cry myself to sleep and wake up and act like i'm fine like I, I think that that is, uh, I'm not going to say that's a coward way to go, but I think that that's the, the wrong way to go because you, you're you hurting yourself by doing that. And I I love stories of people who who show their mistakes. 
I love stories of people who show their flaws because those are the types of people who are saying, look at me, I'm not perfect. Don't think I'm perfect. And if you look at my fallacies, you can see how I have grown as a person and hopefully this helps you grow as a person as well. Yeah, I think there's nothing more attractive than honesty. And I think vulnerability is honesty. It's honesty with our emotions and our experiences and how we really feel about things. And once you show like the range of all your emotions, I think people respect that, right? Because we all go through those range of emotions. And, you know, if you live long enough, you're going to go through wonderful times and you're going to go through terrible times. I mean, you're, that's just the way it is. You know, that's how life is. And, you know, I admit that when I was going through my depression and anxiety, it was hard for me. I mean, I'm a mother of two daughters. And at that time, you know, you, as a mother or, or a parent, you know, you're, you're used to taking care of your children. And, you know, when I went through my depression, it was during a, horm a hormonal change. I was actually going through menopause. And I had no idea that that could trigger a depression. And it did a very severe depression. And so I was confused. Everything seemed to be fine in my life. There was no trauma that was going on. And, but when it happened, you know, my daughter, my daughters, both of them kicked in and they said, mom, you know, you need to get help. You know, you need to make a doctor's appointment, please get help. And I, 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 I didn't want any of it. I didn't want my daughters involved because I thought this is not the way it's supposed to be. I'm supposed to take care of them. They are not supposed to take care of me. I felt <laughs> like I was being a burden. Well, it's true. Yeah. It's like, you know, you know what I mean? And so, and you know, there was a point where my daughter says, I want you to come and live with me. And I said, no, there is no way. And at the time she was engaged, to her fiance, I said, no, he's not going to, no, that's not going to yeah. work. I'm not going to impose on you. And she said, you will do this. And, you know, I look back now and I am so thankful and so grateful. And, you know, it was a special time for us because I realized, you know, there is, um, it means a lot to be able to give love and care to somebody that you love and care for. Uh, it's it's kind of I call it the circle of, of life because you know we all give and receive. That's like the circle of life that keeps us connected. Um, you know uh, that was a lot for me, but I I let it go. And that's the other thing is if you're going through a mental struggle or mood disorder, accept that help, receive that help from people that you love. Um, you know I also went to a support group which I did not want to go to a support group. <laughs> I did not want to talk to a bunch of strangers. The yeah. last thing you want to do, you just want to stay in bed alone. You know, so, but again, my daughter said, you are going, you're going to go. And so I did it for her. Um, but when I went there, I realized through their stories that I was not alone, that these, some of the people were feeling the same things I was feeling. And like I said, you do feel alone, no matter how many friends you have, no matter how many, how much family you have around you supporting you, the mood disorder makes you feel disconnected from everyone. And that is one of the hardest things. Uh, but at that moment, I felt, you know what, I'm not alone. And there were people that cared. Even, these were strangers that cared. And that's it is it doesn't have to be a friend or a family member. It can be strangers that have just gotten to know you that care about you, that have been in your shoes. And that's why I do you know, encourage people to go to support groups because even though it seems like the last thing you wanna do, I got so much um, advice from them on who to go see, uh, what to try, you know, um, advice from people that were experienced. And, and that really is, um, you know, something that's just so important. Yeah. While you were talking about your daughter, I was just thinking like, that's one of those things you got to check your ego at the door. Like you can't, 
you can't allow that to affect, you know, how, how you get your help. And when you've got somebody reaching out to help you, you've, you just got to drop that veil and be like, yep. <laughs> yeah, I, I do need help. So that's, that's something that as a, as a mother, I'm sure that was super difficult. And I, I, I started laughing when you were talking about like, no, I'm supposed to be taking care of you. Like, you're not supposed to take care of me. And that, I know that's how, that's how a protector, like you, you seem like you have a protector mindset and especially with children. And that's, that's your mindset is no, like, you're not supposed to help me. I'm supposed to be the one helping you. And every once in a while, sometimes you've got to be the one that, that gets help. And as you said, it's a circle of life. Like if you might not intend, you know, some people say, well, I, I give so that I know I'll give back. Well, sometimes you just have to get back when you least expect it, not because you aren't giving so that you, you do get back. You, you give your whole life. And now at, at this random moment of time, it's, it's just time for somebody to, to help you and assist you uh, with something that you're going through. I know that a, a lot of people, I will say, they they tend to struggle with um, with accepting help. Um, mm -hmm. I, I know a lot of is it could be like business owners, uh, people who run businesses. They they tend to they want to have that I did it all myself type thing, and you know I, everything was all me and and that kind of mindset. But again, check the ego at the door. You you sometimes have to let go and just let let somebody else take on some of that burden so that it makes your life easier. The, you don't get extra medals in life for doing things yourself. <laughs> like uh, right, right. <laughs> I mean, the best things are done with teams, right? Like with other people, uh, you know, building something together. And you know, that's that's a really good point because you know you we, you know, a lot of us can be successful in different parts of our lives. I mean, I was the person that was, you know, did well in school and, you know, you know, managed a corporation, you know, I, I did a lot in my life. And so you get used to, you know, being successful at different things. But the thing is, is we don't know everything and we can't be successful at everything. And so we've got to accept that there are people that are more experienced than us that um, do this professionally and have had, you know, a lot of people come their way that they've been able to help uh, where we really should be embracing those people and saying, you know what, um, I've tried this on my own and it's not working and I can't do anything unless I can get this fixed or at least I could get better. Um, I don't want people to think that they're broken. That, that's why I didn't want to say about this whole thing about being fixed. But, but the thing is, is that sometimes you do feel broken. But, you know, we all go through these kinds of mental health struggles. And if somebody else can help us through, you know, hold our hand and walk us through and show us different ways that we can get better, why not accept that? And, you know, I've had people um, on the podcast say, Things like, you know, whether it was um, um, maybe depression, anxiety, panic attacks, uh, addiction is a big thing that happens. Uh, a lot of people end up self-medicating, saying, you know, um, alcohol, um, cannabis, uh, meth, whatever it might be to try to quell those emotions. And, you know, sometimes doing it their way. It, that just seems to be a, an ongoing theme. Like I want to do it my way. I want to do it my way, my way. And I had an uh, artist say, you know what? I tried to do it my way for 10 years. I wow. wish I would have done it earlier because I would have had a much different 10 years than I had, you know, trying to do it myself. So I think, you know, it does take a level of, of dropping the ego, you know, just saying, you know what, I'm going to try it somebody else's way. I'm going to try it and see how that fits for me. It's been, it's worked for other people. Maybe it'll work for me. Yeah. The, the ability to just allow other people in your life. And, you know, we've been talking about this whole time, that trust, 
like that that give and take that trust with other people and just laying them into your life it's it's something that has to be developed you know you have to develop that part of your brain and also earlier we were we were just talking about um where you were bringing up about strangers like you know strangers helping you out and sometimes oddly enough strangers will be the most helpful people that you meet because i think it's because of emotional attachment because when you aren't emotionally invested in somebody it's like you it's easier for you to make decisions so i am not a gambling person i hate gambling because i lose all the time <laughs> and i was using um some one of the betting apps and you know i i would just bet on stuff and it i didn't care what it was i would i would just bet with you know 50 bucks or something like that i i don't bet a lot of money cuz again i lose and i would bet on things that weren't my favorite team because it's hard for me to bet on like my favorite teams cuz i'm emotionally attached to <laughs> to my favorite team and in anything else in life if i'm emotionally attached to it then it's hard for me to get involved with it and i think that's the same way with people in their mindset if you are really close to a person then you know it's going to be hard for you to say something cuz you don't want it to affect your relationship with that person you feel like oh if this goes wrong then you know who knows like we might not be free we might not be friends anymore so i think you know when when you're talking to a stranger or something like that it it tends the conversation just might just go a little smoother because you're like well this person the only thing they can judge me by is what i'm about to tell them like they're not thinking about my past and they're not thinking about you know what i've done and all these things they're only judging me from what i'm about to tell them <laughs> and what they know about me so it's it's an interesting thing on how the dis disassociation with somebody can actually sometimes lead to positives and musicians talk about it all the time they talk about how some of their biggest fans are strangers they're not their their family members or their or their high school classmates it's people they have no idea who they are mhm mm yeah that that's absolutely true i mean one thing that i like about uh support groups um, you know, there's Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, there's a lot of 12-step uh, programs out there, um, Narcotics Anonymous, and, you know, often one of the key things is confidentiality. Um, you know, sometimes people don't say their names, and they just share their stories. And so people connect to stories, not necessarily the person that you are, and, you know, all the other stuff that's going on in your life just focusing on what's going on with you mentally or, you know, with addiction. And that's the other freedom of being in a support group is knowing that you can be open with your story and um, still have the confidentiality and the anonymity that you might want to have while you're going through this. Um, you know, especially if you are, you know, a public figure or an artist or, you know, some, someone like that, where maybe you're concerned about it. I mean, there's a lot of support groups that are online where you may not even have to show, you don't have to show your face. You don't have to show your name. You can just um, participate uh, with absolute confidentiality. And, um, you know, that that's important. It's important, you know, for quite a, quite a few people to, uh, be able to be completely vulnerable to uh, a group of people. And I think, you know, to be, uh, to, to really get the right help, you, you do have to be completely vulnerable and honest. What is something that you feel like people struggle with the most when it comes to, um, I guess, just approaching other people? Like, I, I know we've been talking about that a good bit, but what do you think is the, the biggest thing that people uh, either struggle with the most or, or they just fail to do when they're, when they're trying to contact somebody about, uh, about their mental state? Well, um, I think, I think that uh, something that, that a lot of people mention is, is they don't know what to say. 
or maybe they feel like, you know, maybe their family should talk to them about, about it. You know, there's a lot of different reasons why uh, we don't want to have that uncomfortable uh, conversation. Um, and then, you know, if you do decide to say something, you know, what then, you know, what do I do? And that's it is like, you know, just being able to know how to approach and also what can be helpful and the kind of, um, I guess, words that you can be used. Uh, you know, there are a lot of things that people can say that, that can be hurtful uh, if, if they're not aware. Like, for instance, you know, if somebody says, if somebody overhears someone saying, oh, you know, she's crazy, that's hurtful. You know, that's not really having respect to who I am and or even trying to understand what I'm going through. Um, and that's why I feel like uh, this mental health first aid is really uh, something good for people to, to, to take, to take a course like this, because it teaches you um, things that you could say and also resources that you can refer people to, to get professional help. Um, or even, you know, just to say, hey, let's sit down and talk about this. You know, how can I help you? Just something like that. Something as simple as, you know, what can I do to help? Um, can really just open up the doors to, you know, having somebody, uh, you know, tell you more about what, what you can do. You know, even if you don't have experience with mental health, even though you, even if you don't know what to say, just that show of care is important. And, you know, I have my podcast, Check Your Head Podcast, but we have a website, uh, checkyourheadpodcast.com, where I include like over 125 free and affordable mental health resources, you know, organizations, associations, um, nonprofits that will give uh, mental health, you know, therapies, um, financial help to people that may not be able to afford it uh, for all different kinds of mood disorders. I mean, I have things on, um, I think one is called for the Black Coalition, one is for the Asian Alliance, you know, mental health, um, for PTSD, for OCD. We have everything on the 12 step programs for people that are in addiction recovery. And I think the important thing for people to know, whether they're going through a mood disorder or you're somebody that cares about somebody that is going through a mental health struggle is that recovery is possible. Recovery is something that happens to, you know, almost everyone that seeks treatment and emotions are a period of time. And, you know, even though I say I have depression and anxiety, those things actually occurred at times in my life where I found out as a detective that it was due to hormonal changes in my body. And so most of my life, I felt, you know, really good with my mental health. But it's those key times where you lose it that, you know, depression or anxiety or some form of that creeps in that, you know, your, your life really is at stake. I mean, there are people that don't make it through and we don't want to be, we don't want to be one of those people. We want to persevere. And we also know, want to know what we can do and say to, for those people that, you know, you recognize they're having a, a, a struggle. Yeah, and if, if somebody is going through like a situation like that, it's it's just imperative that you are cognizant and you're and you're mindful of what they're doing. I, I think um I, so I read an audio book um for gosh, I can't remember the guy's name, but um it's it's called Emotional Intelligence. Um the essential guide to something, something, something. It's got a long title, but anyways, <laughs> um, <laughs> the book talks about, you know, just emotional intelligence and how like the things that people do everyday life, um, how you can pick up on their cues and how, you know, it might be the way somebody walks or the way somebody talks and how, how they treat other people and like all these like small cues 
on on picking up like somebody's emotional state or uh, just you know how that how that person uh, functions in life, and I I have a really high emotional intelligence. Like I can I can just tell like somebody's past life, or I can tell um, what somebody does on a daily basis based off of like just watching them. Like I love to watch people. That's one of my favorite things is just people watching, and because I love to understand people. Like I'm just a, I wouldn't say I'm a people person. Like I don't love just being around people all the time, but I like to understand people and hear their stories. That's why I have podcasts and it's, I think it's imperative that all humans have high emotional intelligence and you would not believe how many people have really low (laughs) emotional intelligence because they just don't understand these cues. Like they don't understand like, You know, people always joke about the husband who uh, doesn't pick up on his wife being upset with him. And she's giving him all these clues. And those like small things are what help people who are in a bad mental state. It's just people picking up on these cues and understanding what they're going through. So I said all that to say, I think being able to, you know, understand these support groups like you're talking about this first aid like understanding what people are going through and seeing these seeing these cues and the the crazy thing is if you break your leg or if you break your arm or something like that you go to the hospital and you get a bill to to fix yourself when you have an emotional injury or something like that that can be free like getting getting help and getting fixed you know you were saying you don't want people to feel broken well it's just maintenance you know a car if it's if something's wrong with your vehicle it might still run but it just needs a little bit of maintenance and that's that's exactly what people who are in these mental states they just need a little bit of maintenance they're not broken but they just need a little help right i mean i kind of joke about this but you know, there are some people that take care of their cars and, and bring them in for checkups and maintenance much more than they do themselves. Yeah. And so I feel like if you're taking care of your car better than you're taking care of yourself, you really have to think about that. You know, you really should. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) You know, get that annual checkup, you know, really, really listen to your body, listen to what your body and your mind are telling you. And, you know, keep yourself in top shape if you can, you know, do those things. Because if you're, if you don't have your health, I mean, you really, everything falls apart, right? It's a domino effect and it's going to affect your work, your relationships, everything. Um, The other thing you were saying that was really important, gosh, I can't remember what, what it is that I wanted to say, but um, yeah, it's, you know, mental health, health in general, I mean, we, we have to keep it a priority and it's easy to forget about when we're so busy with our other work, right? Our other things that are going on in our life, but, you know, to have a routine to, you know, make sure that we have, you know, really good sleep, which is a foundation for mental health. I mean, we've all like maybe stayed out too late, didn't get enough sleep. The next day we just felt like crap. I mean, this is, this is something that happens to everyone. And, and then, if you don't and get then a, the person will wonder, why do I feel like crap? <laughs> exactly. They'll, they'll, but it's sleep. It's sleep and getting good sleep. I mean, it'll make you, if you don't, you get irritable. You're going to, you know, fly off the handle. You just won't be at your, at your top, top of your game. Um, you know, just simple things to think about, like, how can I be positive with people in my life? You know, how can they be positive with me? I mean, my boyfriend and I, we talk about, you know, what do we appreciate about each other today? It could be something really simple. Like, you know, you brought me an ice cream cone and I was so, it just made me feel so good. Made me feel like you really cared about me when I, you know, after we had this nice long run and I was exhausted. Um, you know, things like that. You know, some people love meditation. Some people, you know, nutrition is important. But of course, if you are, um, you know, maintenance for a mood disorder, going to therapy, taking medication, these are all things that are helpful. 
And, you know, I had to learn the hard way. I did something that a lot of people with mood disorders do, which is I went on a medication for depression while I was going through my, my bad bout of it. And I felt like, and I got better and I felt like, you know what? I'm good. I've been good most of my life. I'm going to taper off. And I did. And I was fine for a year and a half. And then it happened again. And I stayed in a depression for another year and a half. And that was really, really difficult. So I learned from that is if something is working, you know, continue with it. And, you know, now I found my solutions where I do take an antidepressant. I, and I feel like myself, uh, I take um, a hormone treatment uh, so that my levels are good and my uh, thyroid level is good. I mean, these were all physical things that were causing um, my my condition. And so I am on maintenance and I've been really good with that for the past, I think, four years. Uh, but that's it, is that it is a journey to find what works for you. And of course, if something is working, stick with it, keep it as a routine. Absolutely. And even like my wife recently, um, she'd been on birth control, I think, ever since like the pill, ever since uh, I think she said like she was a teenager or something like that. And she was like, I she'd been doing a lot of research and she was like, I wonder if this like has been affecting my moods or affecting, you know, my mental state. And so she just got off of it. and. Um, she, she says that, she, you know, she seems, you know, a little bit of change, a little bit of mental change, but she was at least uh, aware enough to realize that, Hey, maybe this thing that I've been taking for forever might be affecting me. And she, she didn't want it to, you know, control her moods and control everything about her. And, you know, that's something for women, especially like you know as you were saying you you go through menopause and and all these things that women have to deal with are huge factors because your hormones are crazy like nobody understands it it's, you're an alien race of hormones <laughs> but <laughs> well you know what the thing is is that we all have hormones and one thing that i think should be talked about more is that you know oftentimes mood disorders start around puberty and puberty is a roller coaster of hormones for men and women. Yeah. And you notice where um, there's a lot of teens, or you know, we hear about these high school shootings, uh, things that happen as young adults. Where um, you know, I, I feel like that not only is often a starting point for people that have um, depression or anxiety, but you know, there's a lot of change. There's hormonal changes that can affect, um, you know, we've heard of postpartum depression. Again, that's a hormonal change that is affecting your moods. But, um, you know, during this roller coaster of emotions through puberty and young adulthood, uh, there's also a lot of um, triggers that could happen. There's a lot of firsts, I call, right? You first time you, drink, you try alcohol, uh, first time you might try different drugs, Maybe you're experimental. Um, and of course, we all feel like at that time, nothing could happen to us, right? We're young, invincible. we're invincible, and nobody could tell us what to do because we know it all, of course. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we have our first love, we have our first heartbreak, we have our first job, we're trying to establish our careers. There's so many firsts, and nobody really can help us that much to navigate through all those emotional roller coasters. So, you know, it, it, it's, it, I guess it's good to be educated about all the different um, things that can affect your mental health. And like you said, um, birth control pills, they do affect you hormonally. And yes, it can affect you emotionally. So yes, those, these are good things to be aware of. I mean, I had an addiction specialist come on the Check Out podcast. His name was Dr. D. Jaffe. And he suffered from depression and anxiety throughout his life. And, you know, it took him until adulthood to finally get tested for 
uh, his thyroid. And it turned out that he had a thyroid condition that was causing his depression. Mm. And it was a simple solution, which was, you know, level out that thyroid, take, you know, through medication. And he was better. Mm. And so that's why I, I say play detective, play detective with yourself. Sometimes um, doctors may not know as much as you do about your body. They might not even have the time to listen to all of, of your symptoms and what you're going through. And I will say that when I was going through my condition, I saw so many doctors, psychiatrists, OBGYNs, and none of them brought up the fact that it could be a hormonal, hormonal change going through menopause. And I look back and it upsets me because I could have figured out the answers sooner if I, if I knew that piece of information. So these are the things that I'm trying to kind of uh, get better at with, through, through the podcast, because I have been amazed at what people have found out about what has caused their mood disorders or their addictions. So I know we've talked about everything under the sun, but let's get into more of uh, your work specifically, because I, I like to make sure before we wrap this up, uh, people understand uh, everything that you do. Do you, do you have a book? I mean, I know you have the podcast, but do you have anything like other, other stuff out as well? You know what? I just have the podcast right now. Okay. And um, I'm a life coach for musicians, but I am, I'm thinking about putting a book together, which uh, I've been getting a lot of um, feedback from, you know, people about, you know, how much they enjoy the podcast I mean, we focus on real world solutions with musicians and also professional advice through experts. And, um, you know, so now uh, I'm, I'm doing the Check Your Head podcast. I'm also partnering with different musician nonprofits like Sweet Relief Musicians Fund, uh, helping raise money for their mental health fund. Uh, so a lot of it is being an advocate, uh, raising awareness, and also focusing on solutions. I'm gonna give you a cheat code. There's a guy named Bobby Osinski, and he has a podcast called the uh, the Inner Circle Podcast, and he just brings on like audio engineers and just people in the music business. Period. And um, he, his last question in all his podcast is, uh, "What's the best business advice you've ever gotten?" And so people answer the question. Well, he recently came out with a book. Well, it might not be recent, probably like a couple of years old or so. But um, the book is called 150 um, Business Like Advice or some music business advice. So that's the book is literally just the last question that he asked in his podcast. So <laughs> I was like, that was really creative. Like he just literally stole his own information and created a book out of it. So yeah, if you, if you plan on doing a book, there you go. It's just probably just take some stuff from your podcast and boom, you got a whole book already written. Yeah. I think that's great advice. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, uh, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, we also have a YouTube channel. So, um, all of the unedited musician interviews and, uh, mental health expert interviews are there. Oftentimes we cut the interviews down uh, for the podcast to keep it within an hour, but I really feel like the gold um, is the mental health experts. I mean, they have taught me so much about different conditions and different therapies. It's really opened up my eyes. So I feel like the, our expert series is really cool on YouTube and, um, and, you know, just, I guess, follow us on our socials at check your head podcast and check head pod on Twitter. And, um, oh, and be sure to visit the website at check Cause there's not only the podcast episodes, but also like all the resources, all the solutions for recovery that you could try. Awesome. You beat me to it. I always ask people to make sure they give all their socials and, and ways that they can reach you. Um, 
is is there anything specific that we didn't talk about that you want people to know or uh, some information anything like that um i guess if you know we're doing this thing um called the adabug program uh through sweet relief and raising funds for mental health and for the check your head podcast if there are any local bands or you know bands in general you know big bands that are going on tour uh get in touch with me if you want to do a benefit show uh, at checkyourheadpodcast at gmail.com. And, you know, we work with everyone and we also promote all of our benefit shows. So uh, it's, it's a great way to really raise awareness and also raise funds for people, especially during the pandemic. You know, a lot of musicians have had their tours cut short, have, um, you know, really feel lost in a way, along with their crew, you know, everyone that goes on tour with them. Um, and, you know, it helps. It helps to be able to give to those people that, you know, need to go to therapy or need to find their solutions that may not be able to afford it. So, um, yeah, anyone interested, just get in touch with me at checkyourheadpodcast at gmail.com. Awesome. And thanks Thank so much, Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on and, and, and sharing. And I really hope that... Um, you know, everybody who watches this will will understand the significance and importance of, of mental health and uh, reaching out to somebody to to help them out because I, I definitely think it it truly it truly makes a difference in people's lives. But um, thank thank for everybody for tuning in, and this has been Mary Fong, and we'll see you next time.